Hello and welcome everyone to the whatis.com virtual book club. My name is Wesley and we have Ben, Alex, Caitlin, and Peggy here with us. We're all technical writers on the whatis.com team at TechTarget. So today we will be doing chapters one and two of The Phoenix Project, which is a business novel by Gene Kim, George Spafford, and Kevin Baer. So let's talk a little bit. What happened in this section? Uh, in the first chapter, we meet the protagonist, uh, Bill Palmer, who is uh, the director of mid-range technology operations. And he suddenly and quite reluctantly promoted to VP of IT operations by the CEO, Steve Masters. Uh, Bill is then tasked with an IT emergency having to do with the company's payroll. And in chapter two, we meet members of the finance and IT teams uh, and Bill attempts to gain situational awareness. So for, you know, these two chapters, what did you like about it? You know, what stood out to you? Uh, one of the first things that stood out to me was the narrative, uh, the narrative structure of the book. Um, so instead of just focusing on hard skills and more dry content, the book also includes soft skills and a lot of communication between team members. And it gives you a lot of, uh, in-depth discussion about each character. Yeah, I like the narrative too, because in addition to the interactions between the characters, you also get to see Bill's sort of inner monologue about all the challenges he's facing. And he's kind of thrust into a situation he doesn't know a lot about. And for me, who also doesn't really know what it would be like to be Bill working in that role, it was really helpful, engaging and engaging to learn this information that way. Yeah, I mean, I, I think the narrative worked really well also just because, you know, it's an effective way to illustrate that, you know, DevOps is not a technology, but it's, you know, rather a culture. It's something that you can't buy. And, you know, it really does give you a peek into like, you know, each individual smaller change that ends up contributing to a larger change. So, um, yeah, I mean, what also stood out to me was just the organization of Parts Unlimited and how it's presented. You know, we've seen from the first you know, bit of just how the company is presented, um, you know, state of the company, the mess we're introduced to, and just how bad it actually is. So you know, on that it's, subject, what do we know so far about the company and, you know, this mysterious Project Phoenix? I think you said it well, it's a mess. So we know that the, the book starts off kind of cleverly with a press release, which usually the companies hope are going to be good news. In this case, it was very bad news because their stock price is down 19% in the last 30 days. Um, we know that their, um, Steve Masters was asked to step down as chairman and that they brought the old CEO out of retirement um, and he was CEO 20 years ago. So things have to be pretty bad. The investors want leadership change. They're talking about splitting up the company. Um, the Phoenix project seems to be the thing that was supposed to save the day, but it, it's, it's a big IT project that is literally years late. And in the meantime, the competition is able to integrate their retail and e-commerce data successfully. Parts Unlimited, not successful at all. And Steve has six months to turn the company around. <clears throat> we also know from the press release that um, the analyst is not so hopeful Steve can do that. And she puts more faith in a woman named Sarah Mooton, who is the VP of retail. And so we're waiting anxiously to see who's going to save the day. Do you think uh, this like level of mess, the situation is realistic, like really happens? Yes. Yeah, I think it, it, it clearly shows the, the challenge that companies these kinds of companies who still use the waterfalls and development method um, face every day. Yeah, that's interesting because you mentioned Sarah and that made me think of when um, Wes, Bill's coworker, says she's kind of difficult to work with and then the waterfall method uh, seems to lead to like a lot of siloed departments and parts unlimited like they don't really know where problems are coming from um, when the payroll outage happens and don't have any view of the whole system they just sort of blame each other for it and uh, i was wondering sort of what you guys thought of the some of the character interactions and how um the way the company is structured affects that in the first two chapters 
I think there's a, a wide range of relationships that we see in the first couple of chapters. And I think a lot of them show how different personalities can affect the work culture. Um, I think they also show how like their interactions can affect the overall performance of the company as a whole. Um, I think if we're looking at specific relationships, um, I think a few stand out to me. First, I think Dick Landry is, he's the CFO. His relationship with everybody um, is kind of uh, significant. Um, he's combative and demanding and dismissive and doesn't quite know or understand the back end that, that Bill's trying to describe to him. Um, and I think it'll be interesting to see whether that attitude is a hindrance or um, will help him get things done. Um, I think the, another significant relationship is the one between Bill, Wes, and Patty, um, since it's a completely new power dynamic. Um, you know, they all used to be coworkers on the same level, and now Bill is um, in this new position. He's their boss, and He's, you know, there's a possibility for him to make change and, um, you know, fix the mess that is Parts Unlimited. Um, and when he, when he goes to address the problem, they don't even know that he's their boss. To start yeah, Steve hasn't yeah, told anyone. Right, right. It's a surprise to everyone. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, but he, like, you know, he, he has to figure out how to have authority. Um, but also you know, keeping his team focused and figuring out what talents they have in order how to use them. And um, I think the last, the big one that you see, the last relationship that you see in, in the first two chapters is the one between Bill and Steve. Um, specifically, they're, they were both in the military. And so I think they've both developed a certain set of skills um, that they, they share and the, their connection and um, the way that they, they know how to work based on their military experience. So my thought while reading it was um, the connection between their military experience, is there one between that and DevOps? That's an interesting question. Yeah, no, I agree about that. Cause uh, I mean, you know, seeing the military people like Steve and Bill, like Steve was in the army, Bill was in the Marines. Um, I think it's a testament to the importance of certain qualities, you know, that are important for DevOps to work smoothly. Like, for example, being in the military will, you know, help you, um, you know, probably develop a respect for processes and order. That would be useful. Yeah, I think the military experience, um, I, I feel like it um, relates to Bill and Steve's interaction at the beginning and, and how that interaction worked out, especially in terms of expectations. IT generally has the expectations of always uh, putting out fires and being prepared in case something goes wrong. And you get the sense of that when Bill at the beginning says like, oh, the problem of the day is whatever. And then um, later on when uh, he relates that to his military experience saying, you argue your case as best you, as you can as an officer, but sometimes you have to say yes, sir, and go take that hill. Yeah. and. That, that makes me think of when right at the end of when Steve is trying to persuade Bill to take the job, like he, Bill hasn't taken it yet. And Steve goes, listen, Bill, I need, he appeals to that sense of duty that Bill has. He's like, Bill, I need someone who's like resilient, reliable, always up to the task at hand. And then Bill finally takes the hill, accepts the job. And Steve goes, okay, here's what I really meant by that. I need you to keep the toilets running. I, I should be able point. to use the bathroom. Yeah, like I need to be able to use the bathroom, flush it, go back to work and never think about it again. And I think because, although they have the shared military experience because they're at different parts of the company, they don't know what each other does. Um, Steve doesn't really understand how much work it's actually gonna take to keep the toilets running, so to speak. <laughs> Are the <lessons. laughs> So that's what's going on in Parts Unlimited up to this point. Um, and it seems like Bill definitely has his work cut out for him. And that also wraps up our virtual book club episode on chapters one and two of Phoenix. So um, tune in next time to see what the team does to contain the situation. Thanks for listening.